Welcome to the uh, Lightning Talks 2 session. We have five talks to get through in 30 minutes, so we're going to start right on time and uh, see how this goes. Our speakers will have uh, five minutes to share their work. So we're going to kick this off with Marco Minghini uh, talking about intrinsic quality assessment in OpenStreetMap. So let's give him a... So thanks, Jennings. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Marco Minghini. I will give you this lightning talk on the ESO SM up-to-date web application co-authored with uh, uh, Francesco Frassinelli. First of all, ESO SM up-to-date is a software, is open source under the AGPL uh, license, and uh, uh, it performs so-called intrinsic quality assessment of OpenStreetMap by analyzing the history of OSM nodes and ways. It addresses the needs of researchers, of users, contributors, communities, who want to have a quick, visual, but intuitive idea of the possible quality of the data. There are some links here, the links to the repository, the links to the wiki page. Uh, there's a web front end that you can use to play with the software, and a Docker container for a quick deployment. This is the architecture. Very uh, quickly, the back end is written in Python 3. It fetches data uh, using the OSM API. It converts data into an SQLite database, and thanks to the JSON-1 extension of SQLite, it basically produces a valid GeoJSON that is then exposed uh, through a REST API using HUG. Uh, the front end uh, can be either a web application if you want to run your analysis online, or a command line interface if you want to download the data and perform some uh, additional analysis. Um, as you will see in a minute, for each node and way in a user-selected area, the software computes some history-based parameters, in particular the date of creation, the date of last edit, the number of versions, the number of different contributors who edited each node or way, and the frequency of update. So this for each node and way with some hypotheses. So we consider only the nodes and ways having at least one tag, and we consider a new version of each node and way when there is a new change set. So even if many uh, tags are added in a single change, this is one new version. This is how the web application looks like. So basically, there's a gray OSM uh, base map, but you can increase the color of the base map using this bar. There's a search box here based on nominatim. Here, you have to select the parameter you want to investigate. This is the date of creation or first edit. Here, you select if you want to analyze nodes, ways, or both. And then you press this fetch data button to get this color visualization. So this is the date of creation. In red, we have the ways created less recently. In blue, those created more recently. Let's see uh, another parameter. So this is the city center of Milan. If you were at State of the Map 2018, you should know this area very well. Uh, we are looking at the date of last edit, so the last update. And you can see that most of the nodes and ways here are blue, which means very well um, update of the data, which might suggest good quality. This is the Louvre Museum in Paris, and we are looking at the number of versions or revisions existing for OSM Waze. You can see that for most of them, one, so they are red, so only one version existing. Of course, there are exceptions. Here, if you click on something, you have a pop-up showing you the values of these five parameters, showing you the tags, the links to the ID editor, to the wiki, and so on. This is the number of different contributors who edited the notes in the area of Alexander Platz in Berlin. Again, you see that for most of them, you have ex we have exactly one different person. But of course, there are exceptions. Finally, this is the update frequency, which is also something uh, quite interesting to analyze. Again, in a quality idea, the higher the frequency of update, the higher might be the quality. So what is the message here? The message is by testing all these five parameters together, you can get an overall idea of the quality of the data in your area. And this might be super useful if you need to quickly um, make or choose when, where to make edits or if you need to use the data, or if you need, for example, where to organize a mapping party to update the data. I, as I said, you can also use the software through the common line. Uh, if you need, for example, to download the data and make some additional analysis later on, you have just to use this Python function. You give the bounding box in input, and you get a GeoJSON, including all the nodes and the ways in the bounding box, uh, with uh, clearly all the uh, parameters uh, as attributes of the GeoJSON. Uh, if you want to know more, of course, I had to be very quick, but you can have a look at this paper published exactly one week ago. There are a number of features that we want to add now to the software, so if you are interested to contribute, of course, you are more than welcome. Just have a look at the issue tracker or just contact us um, directly. That's it. Thanks.
Thank you, Marco. We're going to hold all the questions until the end. Uh, next, we have uh, Chris at Mapillary. Hello, my name is Chris Beto. Uh, I'm a solutions engineer at Mapillary, and I'm here to talk to you today about Deraviste, click and go photo mapping. So a quick introduction to this, uh, this tool. Uh, first and foremost, you can call it a proof of concept. Uh, the idea was to create data from images. It's an open source project uh, created by Richard Fairhurst, who, to quote him, says, patches are lovely. Please send patches, so we're looking for more people to collaborate on the development. Uh, there's four contributors so far, and it's not really an editor for OSM because you can't edit things that exist already, but it's more of a creator, so you can create new data. Uh, we also like to think of it as an opportunity to explore a new concept uh, of edit our enriching OpenStreetMap from photos. So when you first visit the website, you're going to find this screen for the Derviste web creator. And you'll see a world map. You'll see edit tags in the bottom right, search for tags, and a set of instructions. You can also, in the top right, turn on the layer switcher. The layer switcher will let you choose some satellite layers as well as the OSM Carto style. And you can click to turn map layer layer on and off. So the mapillary coverage will appear in green to show you where the images exist as a guide. So when you zoom into your area, uh, you can also use the search tool at the top right to zoom in. Uh, you'll be able to then click on the green, and a photo appears. Uh, in this photo, you have a red indicator. It shows you where your mouse is hovering in the image. And you'll also see, as you see on the left, a red line with a dot. And that line shows you the angle you're facing in the camera. And the dot shows you exactly where on the map your mouse approximately corresponds to in the image. Also, when you zoom in, the green mapillary tiles disappear. Uh, this is because we're using a raster tile for performance. And this right now is sort of a bug, but I consider it a feature because it lets you see the ground more clearly uh, without the green overlay. So in this instance, uh, we found a street light. Uh, so once you've double-clicked either on the map or you can double-click in the image, then a point appears in both the map and the image. They correspond with one another. So we can see that in this image, we've double-clicked on a street lamp, and it appears in pretty much the right location on the right side of the road uh, on the map as well. So, so far, we're succeeding at creating this data. Uh, next, you can search for the tag you want. So I search for street lamp. And you'll select that one, and it appears under edit tags. If you had something else to add, uh, maybe you're creating a restaurant, then you can also type in uh, other tags, such as the name uh, or the operator of the opening hours. So what's really important, uh, besides how this tool currently functions, is what we could possibly do with it. So one of the most important things that I want to look into is putting vector tiles into this tool. The vector tiles mean that we would tile the mapillary imagery. And this gives you a little more functionality, like filtering down the imagery by date, or maybe by username. So if you only want your images and from August, and you want to create data from those, then this is helpful. You could also show only 360 images, or you can show all images. Uh, some suggestions have come through, such as saving the last tag you used. Right now, you have to re-enter street lamp each time. Uh, it'd be ideal if it just auto-suggests this to you. And when you submit the data, it asks for a change set comment. So we'd also look at persisting that from your last one. Uh, it's been suggested to do localization and translation. So this is a great way to contribute once we're able to set that up. Uh, so you can have it in your local language. Uh, another is to use computer vision detections, as you see in this image. Uh, it'll suggest where you can look for something, like a crosswalk or a traffic light. Uh, we want to make OSM 
more compatible with, uh, with logging in through the OAuth. And finally, some other items like adding notes, uh, something like fix me, or doing a line drawing mode. So overall, uh, you can view the app at the top link. Uh, the bottom link is the GitHub where you can get involved with development or submit an issue as a suggestion. Uh, you can also tweet me on Twitter if you have ideas about this or send me an email. So we'd love to see more people get involved and please consider trying to use this in your own workflows and come up with new ideas for what kind of challenges it can solve. Thank you. Okay, next we have Min to take us on a tour of 50 states, uh, 12 years and five minutes. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ming Nguyen from California. Most of the talks at this conference are about the present or even the future. This talk is actually about the past, sorry. Uh, I'm going to squeeze 12 years of history into a handful of slides to give you a basic understanding of how OpenStreetMap has developed in the US. From the beginning, volunteers and corporations alike have tried to solve a key problem. How to scale OpenStreetMap's traditional mapping techniques to such a vast country um, that has dyna uh, dense dynamic cities as well as uh, vast rural areas with few potential contributors. Just to put things in perspective, uh, the official unit of distance measurement in the US is not actually miles, it's hours. Uh, so when I started mapping over 11 years ago, the nearest mapper was three hours away from, uh, from me by car. I don't know how many miles that was. Um, so, uh, practically speaking, the U.S. community began in 2007 with the first permanent import of roads from the Tiger and MassGIS data sets. Imports have played an outside, uh, outsized role in the U.S., as you can see, going from blank to uh, seemingly filled in. So those imports kicked off years of large-scale cleanup efforts that, that continue to this day. Um, uh, so you can see here just, so just some of the problems that, we've, uh, that we continue to deal with. Um, so uh, Tiger data from the Census Bureau was, was messy. Um, it was really suitable, it was suitable for display at low zoom levels, but not at higher zoom levels, and let alone being useful for routing. So um, community members have manually cleaned up these misaligned, in some cases, purely fictitious roads and boundaries, um, mostly from the comfort of armchairs. Uh, subsequently, data on waterways, boundaries, and buildings were imported from numerous other sources, um, mostly from the federal government, to give the map a higher quality baseline. <clears throat> Over the years, map improvement efforts have become more localized, uh, mostly focused at the county level, uh, so below the state level, with local communities becoming more involved in all steps of the import process. There have been city, county, and state level imports in 37 states and territories, everywhere from Alaska to Hawaii, Maine to Puerto Rico. With a couple of notable exceptions in large cities like Los Angeles and New York, uh, these imports have been planned, proposed, and carried out mostly by, by volunteers, almost entirely by volunteers. Um, so this is like a really, um, yeah, a really volunteer-driven part of uh, the US, um, US community. Uh, building imports are the most popular kind of import, but from this map of buildings uh, normalized by state population, you can see that we still have a long way to go. Uh, armchair mapping has also played a large role in the project's development. Um, besides Tiger cleanup, a small number of enthusiasts, a relatively small number of enthusiasts, ha have built and maintained massive networks of uh, not just the road network, but also road routes, cycling facilities, uh, and rail infrastructure. Um, they've also established relationships with government and community organizations um, that result in a more well-rounded well map. And of course, there's a much larger group of more casual contributors. Um, the story of OSM in the U.S. is really one of variety. One can't talk about just imports or just armchair mapping manually or just field serving in isolation. If you leave out any of these methods, this is what the vast majority of the map ends up looking like in the U.S. Rest assured, I did add attribution. <laughs> On 
On an organizational note, OpenStreetMap US was incorporated in 2010 to support the project's development uh, and put on the State of the Map uh, US conference annually. Technology companies and universities have, has, have also provided various kinds of support to the project as well. Despite this support, in-person meetups and mapping parties have always been relatively rare in the US, even as they are hallmarks of OpenStreetMap in other countries. But slowly, communities are popping up across the US in some surprising places. We need volunteers, OSM US, and corporate partners to step up and harness these budding opportunities in various parts of the US to build a solid foundation for the community. It's my sincere hope that in 12 more years, this history lesson will require a lot more than five minutes. Thank you. Okay, and next we have Andy. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andy, and I'm part of the GeoLadies PH. Sorry. And we've been asked before uh, for tips on how to start their own uh, ladies group or, or how to encourage more ladies to participate in mapping and an open street map. So I hope that through this presentation, we could, get, give, we could inspire more to uh, mobilize more women, both men and women, to start projects for uh, underrepresented communities and for their advocacy. So um, this is a project I have with Miss Nali Vicario Defner and Mike Labrador. We're all BI, uh, GIS and BI specialists for the Philippines Department of Social Welfare and Development. So Mapa Babay. Um, it's actually composed of two words, mapa and babae. Map me, mapa means map and babae is woman. But together, these two words mean also women too. So what, why, why this project? So we, we agree that a map sometimes only shows what the map maker uh, knows or at least cares to show. So with a lot of... Uh, map makers who are men, there are all there could be gaps. So we want to help fill this gap. And through OpenStreetMap, we want to encourage more women to uh, make pro mapping projects. So um, let's look back a bit on history. So I'm sure a lot of us already know about this. Um, the woman mapper has been ha has been challenged to join has been through a lot of challenges. So before uh, mapping has, was made via ships and women were not allowed to enter universities. So those are challenges for women to join the mapping process. And if you recognize this by N, uh, a nun in the 10th century, that's the first map that's, heard, that's made by a woman. And this one in the 1800s, by Shana did it. She did it. This map. Um, for uh, she mapped the history of her tribe. There. And in the Philippines, if you can see here in this photos from 2009 to 2011, at at most there are at most two to seven ratio of woman to man. Uh, so we want to change this ratio. And we did this through the Mapa Babae workshop. It's, it started in 2018 as part of the International Women's Day. So we first taught OpenStreetMap and we, made, we did a mapathon with women and for women. So men are also invited. And from the participants' inputs, we recognize that these are the facilities that are important for women to be mapped, so for health, for fertility clinics, hospitals, um, for, uh, for, for protective VAUSI desks, violence against women and children desks, women and children protection desks, and the others that, that are listed here. And this is the output on that first mapathon. So we thought that why not choose one of these facilities that are important to women? 
and make a map out of it. So we made Map of Abaya 2. We did Map of Abaya 2, but we did several series of mapathons in different venues and dates to be able to make this output map. So it shows the number of cases of violence against women uh, as the base uh, layer, and then it can be overlaid with the hospitals, police stations, breastfeeding stations also from the, some projects of jail ladies, and centers for women, and other facilities that cater to women, to women's needs. And lastly, in March 2019, we also had Map of Babay 2019, When Women Map. It's a sharing and mapping on OSM focused on women as agents of development and answer. And to answer the question, what happens when women map? And these are the highlights of the feedback and answers to that question. So, I recognize OSM as a venue to empower local knowledge. Maps are useful to locate facilities for operations, especially in the far-flung areas. And this, women's perspectives matter. So, inclusive mapping may bolster inclusiveness in political, social, and economic areas. It can be a tool for public participation and hopefully democratization. Uh, thank you. Okay, so we do have a couple minutes here for questions, so I'll have all the speakers come. I'm sorry, that's totally not true at all. <laughs> I lied entirely. Our final speaker is Ilya. Is it working? Yeah, okay. should, should work. Cool. So, hi, I'm Elias Verev and I work in Juno. And Juno, uh, working in Juno allows me to help OpenStreetMap in quite unexpected ways. Like just uh, two weeks ago, I was talking about how we shared all of our GPS traces for OpenStreetMap. And now we needed a geocoder. And when you think uh, geocoding, well, in relation with OpenStreetMap, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is nominating. Uh, it's pretty good. It's maintained by the community. Everyone uses it. And we tested it uh, and decided to uh, package it uh, into container and put it in, in production. So I was tasked with uh, dockerizing it. But it turns about to turned to be a quite complex task. Uh, it's big and it has very many moving parts. So I asked for a couple of days to try and make something better and smaller. And why I thought I could do it? Because most geocoders, well, all of them, including Nominatim, are built with forward geocoding in mind. Like from address, you get a location. And you have to focus on parsing texts and uh, building a structure from that. And we needed a reverse geocoder. And there were no reverse geocoders on the market. But for usual geocoders, uh, reverse geocoding is just an afterthought. It's just uh, finding a closest object, like a closest polygon to the location, and producing the result. For most cases, that works. Like find the closest building, find its address, and print the result. But OpenStreetMap is not perfect. Uh, in OpenStreetMap, there are many unmapped or partly mapped places and many anomalies. Like, what do you do when there's a building inside a building? Which of the addresses you return? Or, for example, where there's a building with house number but no street. From which street do you infer the name? Or uh, when uh, the house is on the opposite side of the street, do you return it or do you infer somehow house number or something? And the first fourth case is interesting in that it's a very, very long building, and by giving its address, you might confuse the user. Sometimes it's better to give a different address, like building near it. Also, there are address points. Uh, they usually used for corner, buildings, corner buildings that have uh, two or more addresses. 
And at first it looks simple, just take the closest one and return it. But when the address points are inside buildings, they infer the addresses on the whole building. So in the first case, it's not right to return the closest addressed object like most decoders do. You have to return the building number six, which infers its address from address point number six. And in the second case, point 62 is closer to the location, but uh, the location is closer to street K, so you might want to address <coughs> the K street, which is 11. And addresses in OpenStreetMap can go on anything. It's just a couple tags. They can go on address points, on points of interest, like shops and cafes, and on the building that contains them as well. And determining a proper address for a location becomes quite an interesting and non-obvious task. It's not just returning the closest point. And there are also points of interest that are polygonal, like schools or churches. They mark the address for a territory. And you don't always want to return the territory address for a location. Like for the red point, it is better to return house number 35 than 40. In this case, we just transfer the address to the biggest, like the main building of the area. That's usually correct. And when polygonal points can be inside buildings, in this case, we convert them to a point. And there's just a few examples from our hundreds of test cases. There are also different ways of addressing OpenStreetMap, like address interpolation or place addresses instead of street addresses. But since uh, we as Juno operate only in New York City, we decided that uh, address points and buildings could be enough. And this thing also works, uh, it works in production, is deployed, and it's quite fast, more than 50 requests per second on a single core. And basically inside it just a dozen of SQL scripts, so it is very easy to package. And some of these scripts uh, work on the plain SMTP JSQL database. And just last week, uh, we got permission to publish it into open source, so by this address, you can see it and learn from it. That's all. Thank you. Time for maybe one quick question for any of our speakers. They take it. Yes. So basically, how do you deal with uh, at countries where there aren't actually addresses, but you say uh, it's 30 meters far away from this and this supermarket or so? On? So is is this something this project is also taking into account? I, I didn't quite get the question, but uh, the idea was yeah, to set limits how far the address can be, and that, for example, a shop uh, ha has its address inside 20 to 30 meters, but a plain address point uh, deals with the whole building and, and stuff. So yeah, the algorithm is quite complex, and in that address, uh, on the GitHub, you can see how it's all calculated. So the geocoder itself is just one big SQL script. It's heavily commented. All right, let's give all our uh, speakers.